I'm Joseph. And I'm Nick. And this is Fish Jelly. Soy gay. <laughs> yes. C. <laughs> How are you? Good. How are you? Okay. Still alive. Yeah, it's been a testy, cranky week. Oh, cranky, huh? Mm-hmm. Okay. Try you in the public, the court of public opinion. Well, that's, there's a lot going on. Mm-hmm. And the world's not very forgiving to people like me, but... Okay, Trooper <clears throat> Capote. Well, you know. They'll appreciate me when I'm gone, oh, I suppose. Oh, God. <laughs> okay, Drag Race UK, Series 3, Episode 2. Uh-huh. Last week's episode, the challenge was like a spoof on Peloton. I don't have a Peloton, but I'm familiar with those, uh, like sort of the concept of the videos and how the trainers are very aggressive. And so there were like, what, 11 contestants doing this like commercial kind of? Yeah. It was a little long winded. Yeah. Because then they broke into groups of, I think... There were three groups? Well, they made them all do something at once, which is unnecessary. Like, there's too many bodies on stage. Yes, that's what I was trying to say. And then they have them uh, do sort of, like, group bits, which didn't seem equal. Like, some seem more complicated than others. That's, like, always... It's, like, it's like when they got all pissy about uh, Katya doing Princess Die. And it's like, well, that part's nothing. It's nothing and, like, yeah, the... Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, sometimes I feel like it's... The, like, the setup is not fair. That being said, uh, Vanity Milan, the only black contestant, and Electra Fence were in the bottom. And Electra had lip sync the first episode. Yeah. Uh, they perform. It was a decent performance. Electra Fence is an incredible mover. Yeah. And dancer. But I think the critique she received both episodes uh, would apply to her lip sync. She just gets too excited. And it just seems frenetic. Like, you're not really connecting with the music. Yes. You're, yeah. I mean, you're just going all out. And she's, I mean, she can do amazing things. But then next to Vanity Milan, who's also a dancer and really seemed to connect with the song. Yeah. It was very clear uh, Electra was going home. It's a bit like, it tells a bit like watching Jan. She's a better, I think she's a better dancer than Jan, but uh, Electra Fence. But that going overboard when you don't need everything in the kitchen sink all the time. Yeah, like when Jan lip sank against Widow Von Du. Yeah. With that Shaka Khan song. That I mean, that was actually uncomfortable to watch. But I appreciate people feeling like this is my last chance. I have to go all out. It, it just doesn't always work. Sure. Then Crystal Versace wins again. So now the youngest contestant this season uh, wins now, the first two challenges, mm-hmm. she's really impressive. Yeah. Um, but uh, some notable thing is in the, ep- well, two things. First, when they're in the back while the judges are deliberating, Vanity Milan says, like, she will not lip sync against her friend. <laughs> and then as soon as they get out there <laughs> and, they, and she's told that she's lip syncing against her friend, She's like, well, I'm going to do what I have to do to win. <laughs> yeah. What happened to you saying you wouldn't do it? Uh, but at the beginning of the episode, um, the AFAB contestant, whose name I'm not recalling, Victoria Scone. Yes. She kind of confronts Crystal about her comments. Well, th- doesn't this episode start off with... <gasps> That's right. Yes, this episode starts off with RuPaul asking Crystal to sort of give like five awards mm-hmm. for like your biggest competitor, the person who you think's going home next, trade of the season, the person who's like old and dated. And Crystal gives my biggest competition to Victoria. But then when RuPaul says, why did you choose her? Instead of stating the obvious, like she and I were top two last week, she goes, oh, because she's the biggest contestant. So, of course, everyone, it's it's like when the season where... Um, Eureka. No, Valentina. Yeah, no, that's yeah, like and someone makes a... Com- oh, Sasha. That's, you're right. Eureka makes a comment about Valentina having an eating disorder, and everyone's like, oh, no, no, you can't. <laughs> oh, yeah, Sasha's like, uh, I've struggled with that for years. Okay, 
I know Bob, the drag queen, has a, a long-running bit about that as well. It's like, you're going to tell the biggest bitch in the room that she can't talk about weight. But, you know, that's the other thing. I think that if Victoria Scone were a cis male doing drag, I don't know that that comment would have had the same kind of cutting impact. I think that we sense that there's a, you, you should tread lightly I think that, but I also feel like, you know, when we, like, if I'm out, like, in a social setting around other gay men, and then, you know, there's always that one or, or, or more people who are kind of bitchy and just can't help themselves but say rude things, to me, it just seems really unnecessary and really a poor first impression. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I'm not defending him, but he's also no, a 19-year-old. No. But <clears throat> to be on a reality a competition reality show where they're asking you to do things to be shady, right? They have a reading challenge. The fact that they're asking you to pick who is going to be sent home next, that's inherently mean. Where, well, or who is the trade of the season. Like, Right. Like, I mean, that's sexual harassment, you, really. You're, <laughs> you're playing on people's fears, anxieties, right. the, their self-loathing, uh, which, you know, RuPaul's Drag Race has never really directly addressed any of those things in depth well the point i was going to make is for someone to go on a show like that knowing they will be confronted with these challenges and then get upset to me just seems like it, it doesn't seem entirely fair like this girl called you a big bitch because you are the biggest one and that was part of the name of the award she gave you and she's you know in the moment that wasn't the funniest joke she could make no and it was late it's lazy and it's but... lazy but i also think like if be mad at rupaul for making her pass out these awards that make everyone feel bad because now everyone infers that she doesn't think well in the biggest competition i i feel like it's all you know even if you if you want to really dig into it biggest competition lends itself to those kind of comments when it should be most talent. You know, there's any other way you could describe that same distinction. Sure. Just inherently, everything these people are being asked to do, they're, they're being manipulated to produce a show that... Sure, and then people, you know, if you're a... he's This person's young and 19, like, you walked right into that trap. Right. I feel like it's... The, the series, reality television itself, is a series of kind of traps and redemptions and the other thing is like having to watch it and hearing victoria <laughs> try to like educate a, a crystal on her experience and why what she said is hurtful i don't like that if i say something i don't know it's just the way people approach things because it's also like i made a bad joke i apologize like i wasn't trying to do that i don't need you to explain to me why you're happy being fat. Like, I don't give a fuck if you're fat. Like, <laughs> I mean, I wasn't making fun of you because you're fat. I just made a, a bad joke because I felt under pressure. I feel like it was very clear that that's what she did. She made a bad joke under pressure. Right. And now we have to have this, like, educational moment. It's very manipulative to the audience because we wouldn't be in this position if you hadn't created these challenges that make everyone feel awkward. So that I don't like. I get tired of hearing everyone having... Like, then make the show about talking about queer people and their struggles. And that would seem more authentic. Like, let's just talk about it. But don't have the producers whisper in contestants' ears like, oh, ask her about her dad who doesn't talk to her. Ask. It's, it, it's so clearly fake and awkward. Yes. Not that what they, their, their experiences are real, but the way it's brought up seems so fake. So, to me, just as fake as all that shit is, it's also very fake for you to be upset about something when you knew that you were going to be told to say mean things about well them. also you know i th i think she's said she's grown up around drag queens right you know that these bitches talk shit like that, yeah victoria says she grew up around drag queens there's no and oh that you know that you they've said were like speaking of mean things when when she said her age episode one but she's 27 i was like there's no way that lady is under 30 but oh my God. <laughs> So I don't know if she grew up around drag queens and she really is 27, then maybe she hasn't experienced how, um, sort of, um, acerbic Ter and terrible they can be. Right. But anyway, moving on. Yeah. Drag queens are fluffy, fuzzy, loving creatures. They, no, it's you know, a subversive sort of environment that's really meant to like 
push boundaries and make people feel uncomfortable. Drag is supposed to make people uncomfortable. Yeah. That's what it was meant to be. Yeah. So the like the fact that a drag queen can't make a a, a bad joke just seems really like well, even like listening to Lady I was listening to Lady Bunny doing an interview for this Canadian television show and the audience was very young, very like you know young queer crunchy like all the pronouns mm -hmm. all the non like all the vegan all the everything and lady bunny was making fun of um a friend of hers who happens to be trans and she was talking about her in a way that like lady bunny style is to be yeah outrageous and the audience was kind of booing her and like like oh you can't say that and even the host was like oh like, it's a joke. Well, I mean, this, is, this has been the problem comedians have faced, you know, uh, generations after generations of comedians. But, you know, how RuPaul kind of feeds into this inadvertently, too, is even at the beginning of this episode, I think he talks, or the, the series talks about uh, bring on the internet trolls or something. He said something like that. But then you're feeding into what can and can't be uh, appropriate. I think we can evolve and progress. Like, I think that's, the great thing about people for sure but when it comes to comedy and subversion and pushing boundaries it's just like don't occupy a space not every space is for everyone i'm not going to go to some old like you know cigar bar in brentwood and you know like think that i'm going to be welcomed on the street from rockingham but but you know what I mean? Like certain environments aren't necessarily for me. And instead of trying to infiltrate that and change it, make my own space where like-minded people can feel safe. But it's like, I don't know. This might be controversial, but I just don't think drag is meant to be fluffy and nice and inclusive. I mean, it is inclusive in the sense that it's trying to um, tear down like the status quo. So it, as a result, it is inclusive. I think it's just, it's weird that we're, you know, examining that intersection where... Drag is, yeah, drag is not supposed to be safe and friendly, but the demands of our current culture want to neuter it. So, like, look at, you know, Coco Peru and how she's been treated on social media. Right. Or I think, like, okay, so my first gay bar experience was in 1997, and it was in Las Vegas at a bar called Gypsies. I had a fake ID, and the first drag queen I ever saw was Chanel, who was on season one of RuPaul's Drag Race years later. And that bitch was mean. Everyone knew it. Everyone knew, like, if you go on a night when Chanel is hosting, she, like, she was known for calling people out and being very nasty. Mm -hmm. But that was what people liked. Mm -hmm. So you would go sort of scared, like, oh, I got to hide because of she. Luckily, you know, I wasn't, I guess, worth enough to talk about. But that was sort of my impression of drag. But then I also associated that with, like, can you imagine how hard it is to step out of the house mm -hmm. looking like that? with all the ridicule that could come your way, you have to have a thick skin and you have to give it back. Now I know 25 years later, drag is more accepted. I mean, it's even like kid friendly and, or people expect <laughs> it to be kid friendly. We've gone to drag con like three times. Mm -hmm. It's primarily like adolescents who are probably not even, I mean, it's mostly like 13 year old straight girls. Um, and, you know, a lot of parents with their kids. Which is great. I and mean, that's great. That's, but it, That serves a great function. But, but it but... changed the landscape of, like, you know, you can't occupy... Some, like, 45-year-old gay guy like me... I'm not 45, 42-year-old gay guy like me, like, enjoying the same entertainment as a 12-year-old girl. Like, if you think about it, it just seems odd. It's but, odd, but but, but, but... but that's what Drag Race is. Like, it's it, trying to appeal to that broad of a... It, it's odd, but that's what we do to... Uh, ourselves in the realm of cinema as far as infantilizing us with these rating systems that and and keeping everything pg-13 so you can have 13 year olds be able to go see the same thing i am and i'm supposed to get the same level of enjoyment about out it uh, and be transported into a world where yeah that's reality that nobody ever talks about sex or we ever see any naked body parts or speaking of pg-13 we're going to do a live stream with sledgehammer horror on october 14th uh, where we're going to rank our 
favorite PG-13 horror films. Which it's possible to do, yes. So, but... no, I'm just putting that out there because um, once I get more information, I'll post about it so people can uh, watch it live. I It's on a platform I'm not familiar with, so I don't know how this works, but I'm assuming people can watch live and ask questions maybe or, or interact. But I think that might be fun. Yeah. I mean, and reality is if no one is watching it, because my other fear is like, oh, with live, because people go live all the time on Instagram. Yeah. And then you see that like you're the only person watching. <laughs> That's so awkward because then I get paranoid like, oh, my God, did they see that I'm there? And then I left. But um, yeah, either way, I think it'll be fun whether one person watches or a thousand people watch. But no, it's the same thing, though. But that... getting back to what you said, yes, it is the same thing. And it is a very odd thing of, of what we find tolerable and appropriate and you know not everything is for every not everything can be for everyone like we need to have special pockets of things right but then you know cinema it's is a business television you know it's all a business so then you have to think about that at the end of the day right exactly okay moving on uh i just wanted to mention because i was listening to a podcast um which I'm not going to mention the name because I don't want people to judge me because it's kind of stupid and basic. But they were talking about, they made some interesting points about this new Judd Apatow project called Bros. Uh-huh. Starring Billy Eichner. Yeah. Which and I, is being touted as the first studio... studio uh, gay, gay rom-com. Yeah. Which, when I, when I thought about it, I was like, wow... 2021 it's well 2022 well, well think back to oliver stone's alexander and the hubbub over like right. the gay sex scene in a studio film yeah but the podcast i was listening to the the points that were brought up that i thought um resonated with me were revolved around there are so many quality queer films with yeah lgbtq plus lead and principal cast members and it just feels like so this Judd Apatow project is like, so all that's chicken shit. Like, like I understand the significance of it being a major studio, but it's also like, who the fuck cares? Like, there's so many great... Well, the other thing it does is it sets up expectations for if it fails. It's like the, you know, you know, prior to Wonder Woman directed by Patty Jenkins, like, you know, can a woman direct a movie that makes this much money, blah, blah, blah. Like, th there's all of those expectations that get placed on it, whereas something like you know, maybe Candyman under the radar. It's like, oh, this made a bunch of money. And sure. now it's uh, the first uh, film directed by a black woman to surpass a hundred million or whatever. Like, so I, I think that that's dangerous to put those expectations on it when really that's a talking point in retrospect. You're, I agree. and I, But, you know, I understand how this makes headlines because it is significant. So I'm not, like, good for Judd Apatow for, I, I guess you know, attaching his name to it, which is probably what is getting it made. I don't know. And I don't care for Billy Eichner, so whatever. I do like T.S. Madison mm -hmm. and Simone, who won last season's uh, drag U.S. Drag Race. Um, and even Miss Lawrence, who was in... Uh, Bill B Billy Holiday. Uh, Amer or United States versus Billy Holiday. And he's on the show Power, I think... But I know him best from Real Housewives of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's exciting. His first role. <laughs> yeah, yeah, his first role in this reality show. Anyway, moving on to uh, films we watched but did not make videos for. Well, we wouldn't have because they're just, they're not new releases. True. So just fun time movies. Fun time Okay, Hider in the House. Yeah, randomly, I think, you know, we're always craving kind of that 80s, 90s period of uh, adult uh, entertainment. And I've been aware of Hider in the House, but I've never seen it. And we landed on that. Uh, it was actually, Did I watch that? Yes. Oh, my God, your memory. With Gary Busey. <gasps> oh, that was a good movie. You It just clicked for yep. you? Okay. Yep. He plays a psychopath who grew up in like a very, very abusive home. So the film opens with um, animation credits and we hear uh, the abuse happening to this child. And of note, Carol King is the voice of the mother in this abuse uh, spectacle happening. Anyway, go on. <sighs> Sorry. Yeah, so he grew up in this super abusive home uh, up until he reached near adulthood. 
when he decides to like kill his mom and dad by burning them alive in the house. Mm -hmm. So he gets sent to a psychiatric ward. And then we flash forward to Gary Busey. Uh, his age is questionable. At the time of filming, he was 47. I'm not clear if they're trying to make him like... Because we see a mugshot where he's like 30. Yeah. So I, I was unclear. He's supposed to be 37, I think. He's supposed to be, yeah. He's supposed to be in his late 30s in the film, but he looks... He looks older than his actual... He looks like he's in his 50s. But anyway, he gets out of the psychiatric ward and he's told, like, you need to find, like, housing, which is so crazy to me because a person like him, you would think, would have, like, a social worker monitor him. Right. But they make it seem like, oh, no, you just go out and find housing. It's kind of like in Joker with Joaquin Phoenix uh, going to talk to his social worker. Like, yep, you can't get meds. I don't know. <laughs> right. So he sees a home being built... Or worked on. And he sneaks in and builds himself a room in the attic. And then the family who purchases the home moves in. And now we have Gary Busey in the attic. Just like living his best life he, like a damn rat. He's walled himself off. Yeah, he's built like a room that, that you would like... If someone went <laughs> to the attic, they wouldn't know it's there. Mm -hmm. So he becomes in, in fa obsessed with the, the lady of the house. Played by Tom mm. Cruise's ex-wife. Well, Mimi Rogers. Okay. I don't know her name. Uh, Clearly. And then he uh, starts to do all these crazy things to like get the husband out of the picture. Michael, played by Michael McKean, who is so hard to take believably, I think, is this kind of asshole corporate father. Because you think he looks too soft? Yeah. <laughs> uh, sure, sure. But um, there, it culminates with him... He is successful in getting the husband out of the house, but then the husband comes back. Well, and because Michael McKean is literally cheating on Mimi Rogers, and he uh, Gary Busey overhears him telling a coworker of his plans to see this woman again, and so Gary Busey just, all he does is feed Mimi Rogers the information she needs to catch him. Oh no! In he, the act, no, he sets it up. He pretends to be her husband's assistant and says, "Oh, your husband wants you to meet him for lunch." Come to this restaurant. She goes to the restaurant, and when she sees the maitre d, he says, "Oh, there's a note for you." And then the note says, "Oh, go to this hotel room, this room number. I'm up there. Get the key at the front desk." So she, so this means Gary Busey's character set up all of this. Yeah. Somehow he got the front desk to give her a key. Somehow he knew what room he was in. So maybe Rogers goes upstairs to the hotel room, opens the door, walks in, and her husband's having sex with another woman. Mm -hmm. That was actually a really fun scene. It was a fun scene. Because I'm like, this crazy man, he orchestrated a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but, but anyway. So, but that, so they played, their um, dysfunction played into his hands. So they, the husband leaves, but ultimately comes back because he hasn't heard from his estranged wife. Well, because Gary Busey's deleting all the messages. Yeah, he's doing all this crazy it's, stuff. It's 1989. And <laughs> she doesn't feel safe because now Gary Busey's being kind of crazy. Well, he's he's uh, introduced himself into her life via their son. Yeah, pretending that he's like a neighbor, which I guess technically he is. But um, he ends up killing like uh, Mimi's best friend. Mm -hmm. um, but it culminates with uh, Gary Busey being killed. Uh, what? The end. One but. scene, though, that was making me chuckle is Gary Busey's, you know, uh, just shown up at the house because he, he said, blah, blah, your son Timmy invited me over. Um, but the kid's not there for whatever reason. And the other creepo neighbor, played by Bruce Glover, oh, that's right. is helping her in with her groceries. And so you have these two men leering at her and Bruce Glover, like, touches her ass. Well, and she doesn't react. Gary Busey stops him. But she's just like this object. Mimi Rogers is this woman. She's kind of like an object in her own kitchen. Doesn't do anything to help herself or exert any kind of agency. Yeah, you can read into a lot of what's going on in this film. Just from the abuse and like like the trauma, this lead character's experience, how Mimi Rogers' character is treated. Because even like the way her husband responds to her... Because she's trying to get the house together. Mm -hmm. So she has like contractors and all this and yeah, she, exterminators. She, and the way the husband treats her is she, like she's a nuisance. She's just trying to have a conversation and he's like, I have a project due tomorrow. Like I don't need to hear about every goddamn contractor. Oh, and there was a lot of tension because Gary Busey likes to leave his attic wall in the middle of the night and come downstairs and drink juice and look through papers. <laughs> 
Uh, at one point, he like stumbles upon the daughter getting up to pee. Mm-hmm. That shit was tense. Yeah. This movie, uh, I would actually watch again. I thought it was a lot of fun. It's fun. You know, I don't find Gary Busey the most um, compelling screen presence usually, but he fits. He fits the psychopath living in the attic <laughs> scenario. Yeah, well. for sure. Okay, Lady in the Lake. Uh, yeah, I've been catching up on some Raymond Chandler films for my own personal reasons this week. But uh, Robert Montgomery uh, directed a couple films, uh, and I've seen, I think it's Ride the Pink Horse, which is part of the Criterion Collection. That film I really liked. But Lady in the Lake is uh, famously, he uh, made a film where he the main narrator, the camera is his perspective. So you're seeing the camera's movements are supposedly, you know, the eyes of the narrator. Oh, uh, which does it give it, you a headache? <laughs> no, it's it's interesting because um, it's you know it moves much slower than a person's real eyes. Sure. So that make it creates some kind of you know laughable moments. But for late forties film noir, trying something different, uh, you know, it, it's interesting. Although Robert Montgomery's voice, uh, he sounds just like JFK <laughs> speaking. Oh. It's like JFK narrating this this hard boiled film noir. Interesting. Um, Anyhow, and you know what, I'll skip ahead since it's related. I also watch Marlowe, which is based on Ch- Raymond Chandler's novel, The Little Sister, which I read years ago and I really like. Uh, but Marlowe, you know, the, the Chandler, you know, is writing in the 40s, and this film is 1969, and it feels all kinds of off because it's adapted to this late 60s kind of sentiments. But what an amazing cast uh, is in that film, although I don't think... James Garner is perfectly suited for playing Philip Marlowe. He says all of these smarmy lines, like these bitchy, cynical lines that Marlowe has in Chandler's prose. He says it like comedically, uh, which I just don't think works. But you got Carol O'Connor in there, Rita Moreno, uh, Sharon Farrell from It's Alive, who looks a lot like Anne Margaret to me in this period in the late 60s. Bruce Lee in his uh, American debut the, playing the only villain he would ever play. I was reading an IMDb trivia that Jay Sebring, you know, who was murdered alongside Sharon Tate at the Manson House, uh, is credited with uh, discovering Bruce Lee. Oh. Um, and Gail Honeycutt, who I know from the film Scorpio, who I don't find that impressive. But anyway, um, Marlowe, interesting. Directed by Paul Bogart, who's probably best known for Torch Song Trilogy uh, with Anne Bancroft and Harvey Fierstein. Okay. You know, the, mm-hmm. you, you've seen that with me. Mm-hmm. Anyhow. Uh, I watched Everybody's Talking About Jamie. Which I have not seen. Because we received several comments asking us to make a video about it. I um, I'd asked you before it was released if you wanted to watch it. Yeah. You know, I think I confused that with... There's another... We received uh, emails about a similar movie that I know I showed you the trailer about this queer kid in high school who looks like he's in his early 30s uh who's part of like a musical and he falls in love with oh yeah that's different though yes that was several weeks ago yes but i think i thought that's what everybody's talking about jamie was so that's why initially i'm like i'm not gonna watch and review that because i that trailer looked corny but um i put it on i will say that i thought it was enjoyable the story is very familiar. This queer kid in a small town wants to be bigger than his, you know, his surroundings. He's not accepted by his, by the people around him, except for his mother, who's super supportive. His dad is out of the picture and actually says, like, this is not the son I wanted. Um, he wants to be a drag queen. That's his, like, like that's the main storyline. And everything sort of culminates with him attending prom and drag, but then at the last minute he's told he can't do that because it'll be disruptive. So he shows up dressed in a dress and argues that he's not in drag, he's just wearing a dress. Mm -hmm. Um, And then everyone at school accepts him, including the bully, which was kind of unbelievable. Well, The end. But it was a heartwarming story. I think the highlight was the actor playing Jamie. I thought he seemed like a really sweet person. He can sing and dance. I think the the music was very, like, B-side to me. Mm-hmm. None, none of it stood out. Um, but, yeah, uh, I would recommend it. I think if you're a queer person, it'll, you know, pull at some of your heartstrings. 
I think the most emotional component is how su- seeing how supportive his mom is. Because for like his 16th birthday, she buys him a pair of like red glitter pumps. There's also a character, I should have looked this up because I know you know who this person is. Um, he's a veteran actor who plays a man who owns like a, it's literally like a drag shop. And um, here, I'm looking it up now because I want to know what, oh, Richard E. Grant? Yeah. Uh, we, what do I know yeah. him from? Oh my God. Well, uh, he was just nominated for an Oscar and Can You Ever Forgive Me? Have I seen that? Yes, with Melissa McCarthy. He's her gay friend. Oh, that's right. Yes, that is how I know him. But he's been around forever. No, I know, but I with, do recall With Nail him. and I, he's in uh, Spice World, which I'm sure a lot of gays know him Oh, from. we're supposed to watch Spice World. I've never seen I totally it. Forgot. Um, yeah, so he plays a gentleman who um, owns like this drag thrift shop where Jamie goes to try to learn how to be a drag queen. I thought that character was really effective. And then he has a number where he talks about like his life. And of course, you know, this gay man in his late 60s, early 70s talking about his experience. It was very emotional because a lot of it is like not being accepted. Of course, AIDS. And then we see that his partner, longtime partner, dies of AIDS and he has to bury him and... So I thought that was very effective, but overall, it's just, I know I get flack for this all the time from people who live in small towns. Like, people always comment when I say this that, you know, gays are still being persecuted. I am aware. I know that. Uh-huh. I know that. So, but, but it's just kind of like, watching it sometimes feels a little hokey. Like, Well, because it's changed, the parameters have changed a little bit. Well, and it's also like, you're kind of also... Like, like racism. <laughs> well, because it always like, like switches on a dime like this jamie's being treated poorly in school everyone makes fun of him no one stands up for him except except his one best friend and like he they reference rupaul's drag race so we occupy a space where rupaul's drag race is a thing bianca del rio is in the film like playing herself and then at the end at the prom when jamie stands up and says no i'm going to go dress like this all the kids are like, that's great. You should let him go. And it's just so weird. Like, I understand that homophobia exists. But in spaces, I can't imagine it occurs in spaces where people turn on a dime. You know? Mm-hmm. We're talking like very sort of toxic, conservative environments where people, you know, maybe ultra-religious environments where people are not just going to be like, yeah, it's great. Let him wear the dress. So I think that always... Right, right. So whenever I say that, that's what I'm referring to. Like, in what space, in, in, in what universe are we occupying where people change their minds instantly? Even the school bully... Well, because if they did, we uh, would live in a vastly different kind of landscape. Right. And even the school bully, who's relentless, at the end, when Jamie kind of makes fun of him and everyone's like, ha ha, he burned you, Jamie asks him to accompany him to the dance... And they hold hands and go into the prom together. I, That's unbelievable. Maybe it's good that I didn't watch that. That's unbelievable. But again, I thought it was heartwarming. Okay, next. Okay. Uh, murder in Mind? Oh, yeah. If you're a fan of Charlotte Rampling, I stumbled upon um, this. She did an episode of this series in the 90s called Screen One, which is basically, I think, uh, a, a crime series where there's a different director attached to, you know, ostensibly what are kind of feature-length films that are part of this television series. But she did this episode in 1994 called Murder in Mind for Screen One, opposite Steve McIntosh, directed by Robert Bierman, probably best known for that batshit crazy Nicolas Cage movie Vampire's Kiss, um, which is a lot of fun. Uh, And she plays this psychiatrist who's basically manipulating her patients into suicide. Oh, good for her. (laughs) No, just kidding. And she looks fantastic, uh, you know, as she always does to me, but... If, you, if you're if you a fan of Charlotte Rampling, you know just what I mean. But uh, I recommend that. And uh, lastly, you watched Pat Garrett. Uh, yeah, Pat Barrett. Pat Barrett. Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. Because, because we, we watched... Old Henry. Old Henry, which is about... Billy the Kid. Billy the Kid, kind of. I but, mean, yes. But. Yes. But uh, Sam Peckinpah, I mean, you know, is, is very well regarded for how... His success in um, uh, staging violence. Oh. Uh, you know, the wild munch, of course. And this, I, I think Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid exist between two other very notable films. Uh, the Getaway and uh, Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia, if I'm not 
incorrect, which you show me clips of and you always ask what that movie is. And that's a brilliant, great film as well. Um, but yeah, revisiting Pat Barrett and Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid for uh, something a little more, I guess, realistic than Old Henry, which had its strong suits. But uh, I have to say, I really like James Coburn. Uh, and of course, Bob Dylan is in it and provides oh. the soundtrack. And there are some strangely, like really touching, heartfelt moments for a Peck and Paw film. Uh, significantly when... Um, Slim Pickens is dying after he gets shot, uh, and his woman, played by Katie Urado, who I think is the, f- she might be the first Mexican that was nominated for an Oscar, or won an, uh, I think for Broken Lance. But uh, anyhow, it, yeah, there, it, there's strangely touching moments, and it, it it's very beautifully shot, and, you know, that during the new American cinema movement, it plays like a revisionist Western, even though it's kind of dealing realistically with the history, but uh, very enjoyable, despite, of course, James Coburn being bathed by a bunch of beautiful prostitutes who seem very happy to be doing so. Oh, God. Moving on, projects of interest, something called Musa. Yeah, Ramon, Ramon Gavras, uh, whose first film I really liked, Our Day Will Come. He's, of course, the son of... Is he the son or grandson of... Costa Gabras, uh, and The World is Ours with Isabella Johnny, which I liked from 2018. Uh, he's got a new film called Musa that apparently is in post-production. Next is La Chimera. Yeah, uh, Alice Warwalker. You know, it just occurs to me that I guess I've never looked up how to... I've written this last this surname many, many times, but I... I'm probably not pronouncing it right. But she's the sister of Alba uh, Rohrwalker, who is a, an Italian actress that I really like. Uh, I think this is her fourth film. Um, yeah, but that's uh, Happy as uh, Lazaro was a, a really good film at the 2018 Cannes Film Festival. Okay. Lastly, La Lune Privé. Crive. <laughs> what did you write down? Privé. I said, Crive, I think. Oh, La- I thought which, I heard Privé. But... Which means uh, the moon burst which is wow. actually quite beautiful. It's the 29th feature to be directed by Philip Garrel uh, and will star all four of his children. Um, I know you've seen Louis Garrel in films. You're actually staring at a poster of Ma Mare, which he's in. Okay. Um, so his dad. It's about uh, the tragic destiny of siblings working as puppeteer artists. <laughs> oh. uh, I will be very interested. <clears throat> his daughter, Esther, uh, I believe, was in Call Me By Your Name. Moving on to the obituaries, someone named Roger Michel. Someone named a very notable, fantastic film director named Roger Michel, who I think I discovered died at, right after we recorded last week's podcast. Um, he's probably best known, uh, British director, for Notting Hill, the Julia Roberts Hugh Grant movie, which I'm not going to be on board with. Uh, and he's directed a couple other so so movies like Morning Glory and Hyde Park on Hudson. Or Americans might know him for Venus, kind of a swan song for Peter O'Toole. But I really like a film from 2003 called The Mother uh, with Daniel Craig and Anne Reed. Anne Reed plays this older woman who's having this torrid sexual affair with Daniel Craig, much to the chagrin of her family. Have I seen that? I don't know. I know I've recommended it to you several times. Um, He also did a really good remake of Daphne du Maurier's My Cousin Rachel uh, back in 2017 with Rachel Vise. Uh, the documentary Tea with Dames I recommend. We reviewed Blackbird, uh, which is a remake of a Danish film with Kate Winslet and Susan Sarandon, where Susan Sarandon's dying of cancer. That film I don't, I didn't really like, and I think we gave it a poor review. Uh, his 2020 film The Duke, starring Helen Mirren, um, I have yet to see, but I think I think that released while I, it premiered in Venice last year, and it came out in the U.S. while I was in Venice this year, so I haven't seen it. Anyhow, Roger Michel, a uh, very interesting director. Oh, and The Weeknd with uh, wonderful Leslie Manville. I highly recommend that film from 2013. Hmm. All right. So this week it was your selection for a surprise movie. Yes. And you chose something called Santa Sangre. Santa Sangre, directed by Alejandro Jodorowsky, which was really something of a comeback for him. Made in 1989? Yes, sir. Uh, All right. Severin Films put out a very lovely four-disc limited edition Blu-ray box set with eight hours of footage, and what you watched was the 4K uh, restoration. 
Well, we only have 20 minutes. This film is not something that I think uh, could really be covered in 20 minutes because there is a lot going on. There is. But I'll say overall, I thought it was interesting, enjoyable. I think it's the perfect film. I'm thinking like watch it at like a cute theater like early show on a sunday and then go have like a late lunch afterwards like it's a vibe i'm thinking like when we were in minneapolis and like the uptown theater or something sure it would be the perfect film sitting at home on the couch by oneself watching this i don't know that it uh has the ability to uh (laughs) keep one's attention because it is all over the place but the basic story is there's a man named phoenix Mm-hmm. Played by Axel Jodorowsky, and as a child, the director's son. And as a child, the character Phoenix is played by Aiden Jodorowsky. So they're both of his kids. Wait, that man, the the director. Wait, 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 wait. The director. Both versions of Phoenix are his children. Yeah. Oh, so he was making babies when he was old. Yeah. Okay. You've seen him. You've watched Jodorowsky's Dune. He's in that. He's. It's about his... Try, he tried to make Frank Herbert's Dune into a film. You watched it with me. It, <gasps> oh, I saw it at a screening room. Yes, and you thought he was very enigmatic, because he is. He's a very winning personality. Oh, interesting. Okay. Wow. Okay. And also, so this film was rated NC-17. Really? For what? Well, I think... I mean, we see some titties. Yeah, but... That's it's, it. But it's pretty... And... We see like six titties and two of them are plastic. Yes. So we see three pairs of breasts. Breasts, mother. Mother. Uh, and one pair is plastic. Okay. And we don't see any uh, penises. Yeah, but we I... We see some buttocks. I think it's probably more to the gore and violence. It, it is 1989. Well, I'm surprised. I didn't think it was that graphic. Um, okay. Well, the basic story is Phoenix... Grew up like in a circus environment. Mm -hmm. And he witnesses his dad kill himself after his mother like mutilates his genitals with sulfuric acid. Okay. So then we flash forward to him sort of in a mental health facility. Mm -hmm. And one day he's out like on a group outing when he sees the tattooed woman. The tattooed woman, who we'll get to, but she is a sort of a relic of his circus days. Mm-hmm. So he sort of follows her, and then... He goes back to the sanitarium, wherever. Yes. And then crawls out the window because his mother... Because he sees his mother. But the gag is, he, his mother's in his head. Mm-hmm. So he's imagining his mother, which his mother we have to describe in great detail, but just know that... <laughs> His mother, he thinks he sees her, but it's in his head, and she's telling him to do bad things. But he goes back to perform in, like, a theater circus group, and he starts, uh, he kill, he tries to kill a couple people. Every woman that he's attracted to, his mother... Is telling him to kill them. With her hands. With her, we, we, and we have to explain this in great detail, but yes. So, it culminates with... There was a young girl when he was in the circus as a young boy who's deaf and mute... Alma. Alma. And he's re- Phoenix is reintroduced to her as an adult, sort of at the climax of his insanity. And, of course, his mother is telling him to kill her, but he's able to fight off that thought and, uh, and figuratively and literally kill his mother because we see him, like, sort of turn the knife and stab her, mm-hmm. which is kind of himself. Yeah. Which we'll get into. Um but at that point, someone witnesses him attempting to kill someone, so the police are called, and the final scene of the film is him sort of, like, putting his hands up to the police. And he's saying, my hands. Yes. Okay. So, wow. This yeah. movie, uh, th- there is a lot going on. So, who plays Phoenix's mother? Blanca Guerra, who's also in an Arturo Ripstein film. but uh, She's beautiful. She's beautiful. If you think of her name, actually means white war. Blanca means war? I mean, uh, where, oh, that's right. Yeah. Uh, Interesting, huh? White war. Okay, so we're introduced to his mother <laughs> when he's a kid because she... Across the street from the circus. Across the street from the circus. Circus there, del Gringo. Circus del Gringo. Because Gr- the dad's American because there's a line about uh, he killed a woman in America so he can't go back. Oh, God. <laughs> so 
across the street from Circus del Gringo, which is where uh, the family business is. Orgo. The dad is Orgo. Phoenix's dad's name is Orgo. Across the street is a church or like a temple called Santa Sa- Santa Sangre. Mm-hmm. Okay. We're introduced to it because like local officials are ready to like, uh, uh, what's the word? Demolish? Yeah. They're going to tear this church down. But the parishioners are outside like protesting and the main person running this temple is Phoenix's mom. Concha. Concha. Okay. So <laughs> they're like ready to die. Like the tank or the bulldozers can run us over. And a Monsignor shows up. But then a fa- like a head of the church shows up, father whatever. Monsignor. With like his boy companion, mm-hmm. which is uncomfortable. And he's, and so uh, Concha's begging him like, please don't let this, let them tear down our church. And he's like, no, my child, of course not. He's like, let me but, look at it. But, but take me on a tour of your beautiful temple. <laughs> and they go inside and bitch, this... This temple is some bullshit. First of all, Santa Sangre means holy blood, right? Mm-hmm. So in the middle of this temple, there's a like a pool filled with what looks like blood. And, the, and Concha tells a story to the father, the Monsignor, that there was a young girl who was assaulted, raped. Her arms were cut off mm-hmm. and she bled in this very spot where this pool of blood is. And the pool never went dry. Mm-hmm. So, of course, the Monsignor is looking like, first of all, this ain't nobody's saint. <laughs> like, you just can't pick somebody to make them a saint. And he's horrified by the story. And then he goes and touches the pool of blood. And he keeps saying, this is paint. Yeah, and they keep, they start screaming, holy blood! And then everyone's screaming, holy blood. And, the, and the, of course, the father's like, this is an abomination or whatever. This is heresy. Tear this shit down. So it gets torn down. Of course, the mother's upset. While that's happening, we're introduced to, like, the tattooed woman, who's mm-hmm. this very seductive lady covered in tattoos, who's attempting to seduce Orgo. I don't know why, though. My note about Orgo, played by Guy Stockwell, is that he looks like a crossfade between Rod Steiger and Shelley Winters. I thought he looked like a boil. He, that's what... That, he looks like a that, boil. That's what that comparison uh, is but, getting at. But, anyway, he's... And, of, of, Tattooed lady's appealing and Orgo's not. So, of course, he wants to get with her. So, Concha walks in on him about to have sex with her. And she grabs some sulfuric acid. I don't know why the circus had sulfuric acid. Not even locked up. <laughs> yeah, she just... But she goes and pours it on his genitals and on his head and rips off his wig. And he, uh, of course, is badly injured. He walks, stumbles out into the he street. He cuts off her arms. For, yeah, before he does that, he cuts off her arms. Not unlike the the saint in uh, Santa Sangre Temple, Mm -hmm. he stumbles out into the street and he kills himself while Phoenix, as a young boy, is watching him through the trailer. Locked in a trailer, yeah. Locked in a trailer. So he's taken away, traumatized. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, the the film is really about the trauma this man, boy, experience and how it clouds his life, which Mm -hmm. basically (laughs) results in violence against women but the way it's portrayed up until we realize that it's that she's really not like she's just a figment of his imagination is that because his mother doesn't have because concha doesn't have arms phoenix has to wear like a like women's fingernails uh-huh. and pre- and stand behind his mother and pretend to be her arms and all of her clothes have and all of her uh, clothes are outfitted so that he can easily put his arms through them so that's actually a very interesting and uh, uh, fun part of the film is watching that. Yeah, because his uh, arms fit her emotions. Yes, which the actors had to perform. Yes, so I think that I thought that was very well done. But um, we only have ten minutes. Should I go through my notes really fast? Sure. I thought this movie. I, I know it's categorized as like an avant garde uh, avant garde horror film. Mm-hmm. I think it's more of a comedy. Than a yeah, film. it's. I think. I think it's so over the top. It's hard to take serious. But that's why. Also, why I love it. When Orgo meets the tattooed woman in the beginning, he tells her like, "I'm gonna throw knives at you," and then, in the end, we see Phoenix doing the same with another woman. But I brought that up because knife throwing is very stressful to watch. Yes, I was on edge. 
<laughs> and I know it's not real. Well, and also he hypnotizes them with the knife first, which is interesting. Yeah, that those scenes were so stressful. It's to very me. phallic. Okay, the deaf girl uh, I thought looked like Rebecca De Mornay. <laughs> As an adult? Both. Oh, because, yeah, yeah, I could see that well, as Well, because she paints her face white and yeah. then has, like, painted on eyebrows and lips. I thought she looked like Rebecca DeBorne. Yeah, I could see that. Um, there's a scene where one of the elephants in the circus is dying. Mm-hmm. And this poor elephant, they, they must make it, like... You know, because elephants can Blow. suck up liquids with their nose, their, what do you call it, snout? Mm-hmm. And then spit it out. Yeah. So they had this poor elephant. I don't know what Spitting that was. Spitting out blood. Ketchup or paint. But it looked kind of really sad. But then there's like a procession for like the, fu- a, the funeral for the funeral of this elephant, and then they and it was a big production. Yeah, the quality of this film is quite high. Yeah, like the production value is quite high. And there's this like parade procession, this elephant in this big ass casket, and then they get to the end of the line, and Orgo cuts like like the casket's gonna drop into a pit of trash. Mm-hmm. So they cut the line, you see, and it's all practical. Like, you see this big ass casket fall into this, like, trash pe- heap. And then you have all these, like, local people who are all, like, dusty, mm-hmm. who are, like, trash diggers. Yeah. So as soon as the casket drops, all of the local, like, trash digger people celebrate and, like, slide down into the ditch, which looked real. It, yeah. And then they start tearing at the casket and they start tearing out like pieces of the elephant, like mm-hmm. it's meat. Yeah. Which I'm assuming they're going to eat. Yeah. That shit was wild. Yeah. I thought that was fun. When Orgo, um, after, what prompts Orgo to tattoo Phoenix? He's crying about the elephant. He says, to, to turn oh, um, you into a man, that's he, tat- right. he tattoos him. Phoenix is upset about the dead elephant. So Orgo says, I'm, I'm going to do something that will make you a man. And he tattoos this huge eagle on Phoenix's chest With a knife. to match his own tattoo. I thought that was wild. And you get the, the same, that same bird opens the film. That's right. Um, the like sort of psychiatric facility Phoenix is in... I'm assuming it was a real sort of like sanitarium. And this film was shot in Mexico and Italy. So I, I'm assuming it was Italy. But everyone in the facility except Phoenix had Down syndrome. Yeah. I thought that was... Strange. It, it was strange. Well, and also you meet him cowering naked in a corner like Matthew Waldine in that movie where he believes he's a bird. Mm-hmm. I'm forgetting. <laughs> so... All, like like this group of patients or residents who all have Down syndrome except Phoenix, they go on an outing and they're supposed to go watch a movie like Robinson Crusoe, I think. Yep. But then this like kind of attractive man like intercepts them mm-hmm. and says like, oh, you don't want to do this. I know how you can have some fun. And this man gives them coke, gives them, feeds them cocaine <laughs> and then they go get prostitutes. <laughs> And that's and it's during that outing where um, Phoenix sees the tattooed woman, which then changes the trajectory of his life. Who existence. she is, pro- and she's still with Alma, who she's and prostituting. She's, and now she's prostituting Alma, the poor deaf mute girl. And then we see a, like another what appears to be mute police officer mm-hmm. who looks like Lurch mm-hmm. trying to get on her, but she's thankfully able to escape. The the calypso music during that and how they're all dancing in the street. Reminded me of the music video for that Buster Poindexter song. Um, uh, it's hot, hot, hot. You know what I'm talking oh, about? Oh, yeah. People love There's them. a scene where a man pulls off his ear to give it to Alma. What was that about? <laughs> I don't know. That shit was wild. I think this whole thing, it's very Todd Browning-esque, like freaks. Um, the whole thing with hands and arms is also like the film The Unknown with, with Lon Chaney and uh, Joan Crawford, which if you've never seen The Unknown, that is fantastic it's a silent film my computer is about to die um the it's funny you mentioned that both of Yodorowsky's sons because i have a big note tripping out thinking that the child and the adult actors playing phoenix look just alike because because well, they're actual brothers yeah, this is true um what was up with the invisible man so he wants to be the invisible man he wants to make himself invisible because he's been made to feel invisible oh got it i thought that was well done yeah even though i didn't quite catch it i mean that that's very obvious so i think that's why i didn't think that but it makes sense i think my favorite part of the film is oh what side note though when his mother he does an experiment and conscious like you failed again come help me knit yeah come help me knit these <laughs> socks um my, i think my favorite part is he sees the world's strongest woman and we have a scene of this woman wrestling and it's clearly like a very muscular tall man Mm -hmm. 
but um, he he's attracted to Phoenix is attracted to this woman and invites her back to his little theater in his house. And she's presented as a trans woman. Oh, are we to think she's trans? Well, because she has breasts. Oh, I assumed that that was supposed to be a woman. Oh. Like like a cis woman, she just is like big and strong. Oh, that could be. I, mean, I, she, I, she... I didn't assume she was trans. I think the actor playing the character is a man. Yes. But no, I didn't assume she was trans. I assumed that this was just a big ass, strong ass lady. But anyway, he seduces her to come back. But that whole scene was very comical to me. Yeah. Because she's like pushing him because she's mm-hmm. so strong and he's like a slight little man. And then she asks for a drink and... Phoenix pulls out like a huge bottle of liquor Mm -hmm. and she's just drinking watching the show and then of course he tries to kill her um but it's he chose her because he thought she would be strong enough to kill him yes because he's begging her to break his arms we're running we only have a few minutes left but I thought another great scene was the naked women in the graves yeah, that that was represent good. the tattooed woman he killed. Because Phoenix does end up killing the tattooed lady <clears throat> later in life. But then there's a really cool scene where all these women painted in white come out of graves. And then we see a horse covered in tattoos like the woman. I thought that was... The visuals are great. Then at the end, there's like a puppet. After Phoenix sort of like figuratively kills his mother, then we see a representation of her as a puppet. Yeah. And then we see them singing at the piano. This movie needs more than just a few minutes, but there are so many great oh, I love scenes, it. visuals, ideas. I think this filmmaker is like just a really great creative. It's my favorite Yodorowsky, although The Holy Mountain is a close second. It was a comeback for him because he hadn't done a movie in eight years. Uh, and Tusk, his 1980 film, I've never been able to see, which I think is for kids, but I've never seen a print with... Um, subtitles he did a film after this called the rainbow thief which had a movie night four years ago with omar sharif and peter o'toole which he wasn't happy with and i think was taken out of his hands and it's you know truth be told not very good uh he had kind of a brief comeback in 2013 he did a film uh the dance of reality and then followed up by endless poetry which are kind of autobiographical and feel a little bit like fellini films and i think uh roger ebert has a a quote on the cover of this new Blu-ray that really sums up, I think, how this film feels. It's a, a movie like none I've ever seen before, a wild kaleidoscope of images and outrages, a collision between Freud and Fellini. And there are a lot of things that feel Fellini-esque. Uh, this was produced by Claudio Argento, uh, brother of Dario Argento, the murder of the tattooed woman that felt very giallo to me. Um, but there are, there are kind of like melancholic references this film feels very like it's in the same landscape of something like Wizard of Oz and uh, Les Enfants du Paradis. Um, I don't know. There's there's just so much I love. I, I thought uh, Axel Jodorowsky looked a bit like Keanu Reeves. Sure, he's handsome. Um, but yeah, no Concha. Everything. I don't know. There's it. It was a lot of fun to revisit. It's been years since I've seen it. Um, but yeah, I, I highly recommend Jodorowsky if you haven't seen anything. Um, and I had a quote from him. Go ahead. Uh, that I thought fit. Uh, we all exist in our own personal reality of craziness. Yeah. Agreed. Anything else? No. Bye. Bye. Bye.